have sort of a not have any class on Wednesday of next week and on Monday well like I'll be here and and you can come like if you feel that you're falling behind that we can use Monday as a time to sort of help those that need to catch up to catch up if you feel like you're just having trouble so like I'll be here in this room even but uh you hear what I'm saying? I'm not canceling class. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? But it's just a time that if you want to come, if you feel like you're falling behind, then I'm going to be here. I'm going to be getting paid to be here. Y'all can come if you want. It's not that fine, too. Like, you feel like you're okay. And then on Friday, we'll actually have like a, a help session. We'll review all the stuff for the, for the exam four, which will be on Monday. You understand? So what are we doing on Monday? Whatever you want to do. But I'll be here answering questions. What are we going to do on Wednesday? No. I'm not coming. I'm not going to be here. I'll be in my office if you want to come see me. That's fine. And then on Friday, we'll have a health session for the test. Because we're going to wrap up the material today. We might not finish all the concept test questions, but really, I, I, I put a whole bunch of those so that you can have things to practice. And if we don't finish all of those, if we don't finish all of those, uh, I'll have them. If you go to our website, our course website, um, on the online quizzes, all those questions are here. This is the online students do this. So all the questions that we answer in class are here. Uh, and then there will be a solution here. There is one here, actually. Right now it's private, but you know I'm going to go ahead and make it public. So if you all want to see it beforehand, you can. And I'll, let me send a message to my online students. Okay, hold on. Give me just a second, OK. Okay, so even if we don't finish all those concept test questions, they'll be online and you can look through them. If you have questions about them, you can come see me on Monday or in my office on Wednesday or on Friday too. All right, y'all done a really good job this semester. We've pushed through some pretty tough material and the class has done pretty well as a whole. Uh, but we need this one final push. For some of you, this last test is important for the letter grade that you'll get uh, in this class. So. Don't shirk it, okay? It should be a, a test that you can get a good grade on. Okay, so let's look at interference and resonance. Uh, always interfere with one another. We've already seen this, and we'll see it again in the concept test. Got it. Always interfere with one another, uh, and sound waves also interfere. Right, so we saw this last chapter uh, where waves are, sound waves interfere in the same way as light waves in the previous chapter. And as you know, waves can either have constructive interference, like if you're a killer whale and you want to eat that seal. I'm sorry, I shouldn't bring that up, should I? That was sort of a sore point, I think, for some people. So waves can have either constructive or destructive interference. And we'll see in the concept test out. We'll deal in the same way as we did with uh, the light waves. In fact, you'll see it both for sound waves and for light waves on the next test, where I can have two waves that add up like this. What would this be? Constructive or destructive? Yeah, this is constructive because the peaks line up with the peaks. Or I can have destructive, which looks like this. Peaks line up with the troughs. I add these together, and that gives me nothing at all. So waves can have either constructive or destructive. Uh, for example, noise canceling headphones. Any of y'all have any of these noise canceling headphones? Yeah. The way those work, you have these headphones on your ears. They have little microphones that detect the ambient noise. So let's say the noise coming into your into your ear, or the ambient noise, the outside noise, that it has a waveform that's all funky, it looks something like that. Then what the headphones do is they produce a waveform that looks like that. And so when you add those two together, you just sort of get a little bit of noise. You get a little bit of residual noise. 
I've never used them, but I gather that they're fairly effective in that. They detect the outside music or the outside noise or structure or whatever people talking, and then they invert that signal and create a signal that's exactly the opposite uh, a sound in your headphones, an actual sound that will combine with the outside noise and destructively interfere. So these noise canceling headphones detect the ambient noise and produce an uh, an out of phase sound wave. to cancel the outside sounds. Okay, you know, I've never done this, but uh, they say, because we don't have a boom box at our house that has detachable speakers, but I've heard it said that it can do this, that if you have a boom box with detachable speakers, you have, you can take your speakers, you don't need to write this down, I just thought this was very interesting. You can take your speakers, and take one of the wires, right? You got two wires that come to the back of your speakers. If you take these wires on one of the switch on the speakers and you switch them, like you put the black in the red terminal and the red in the black terminal, and then you put the two speakers up next to one another, that you won't hear anything at all. Because when you switch the wires, that switches the electrical signal, which switches the phase of the sound that your speaker creates. And then when you put them up together, those two waves will destructively interfere. Isn't that cool? I've never done it, but we don't have a boombox that does that. But uh, I'd love to see it if somebody does it. All right, we'll do this quick test, although the answer's right there. If you're not getting a joke part, because I don't have many left. Right, what type of interference takes place? Constructive, destructive, or explosive? All right, we'll stop at uh, 25. Oh, 100%. Hey, have you ever tried to eat a, very, a clock? It's very time consuming. Okay, we don't have much longer left, do we? Okay, so uh, something else. Have we already talked about beats? We have talked about beats, right? Yeah, so... Um, Remember with beats, I don't know if I said this, but the frequency of the beat is equal to the difference in the two frequencies, the absolute value. So if I have, you know, one frequency that's 150 hertz and one that's 151 hertz, my frequency of the beat will be one hertz. Now, we can get resonance in a tube. Can occur in a tube that's closed on one end. When the tube is some multiple of quarter, when the tube, the length of the tube, excuse me, when the length of the tube is some multiple of quarter wavelengths. Let's take a little bit of a step back though. Well, let's say that I have a string, right? I have a string, it's attached on both ends. If I put a wave on this string, it'll look like that as it travels down the string, and then it'll bounce back. And when it bounces back, this wave will actually invert in phase, and it'll bounce back like this. And it'll continue to bounce back and forth and back and forth. And when that wave does that, we get a resonance. That's what it, it means for a wave to bounce back and forth on a string, like on a guitar string, or like in a pipe, like in an organ pipe, or a flute, or a saxophone, or whatever it is that you're dealing with. And so these are called resonances when you have these waves that bounce back and forth. And we're going to look at uh, three different scenarios. Two of those are going to be identical. Uh, and looking at the different types of waves that can resonate within a closed or open tube. First, we'll look at the uh, tube that's closed on one end. Now, at the closed end of the tube, it's going to look like this. At the closed end of the tube, the wave is locked into a um, into a node. If I were to look at my wave at this end, my wave inside this tube would look like this. So this is called a node. When the end of the tube is closed, it's like the wave can't oscillate back and forth. 
is same on a guitar string. If you have a guitar string, the end of a guitar string will look like this. This is the string. On the end, it can't vibrate because it's at a fixed point there. This is also called a node. So that's called a node. This is called a node. Anytime you have the point of your wave where it's not moving back and forth, see like right here, my wave moves from here to here. This is not a node. In fact, that's called an anti node, which we'll write that down in just a second. So, anyway, at the closed end of the tube, when the amplitude is zero, the air movement is halted. Yeah, it's halted. Um, then at the open end of the tube, the reflected wave is at an anti-node. All right, so this is called an anti-node. Right. Also in these other places, like right here, for example, this is also called an anti-node. Anytime that you're not at a node, that you're in the middle between two nodes, these are called anti-nodes. And at anti-nodes, the waves are allowed to oscillate back and forth between those two extremes. Node and anti-node. Be able to identify nodes and anti-nodes. When it's at an anti-node, you have maximum amplitude. And um, we can undergo total constructive interference with other incoming waves. Okay, let's look at the different scenarios for a open closed tube. It'll look like this. If I have a tube that's like this, this is the, the length of my tube, I'll call L. How many wavelengths are in this tube going from this point to this point. Now remember, if I were to draw a full wavelength, a full wavelength of a wave looks like this. And here, I'm just, I have this portion of the wavelength, and then this part in the bottom is the reflected portion. So it goes back and forth inside this tube. How much of a wavelength do I have here? Is it a half a wavelength? Full wavelength? A quarter wavelength? What is it right here? Right, it's a quarter. Let's look at it over here. So on this diagram, it comes up to here. So notice that is one quarter of the full wavelength. So I have this distance also is a quarter wavelength. Okay? So um, I can say then that lambda is equal to 4L. Just saying that L is equal to a quarter lambda, so lambda then is equal to 4L. And then further, I can calculate the frequency. The frequency then is going to be V over 4L. All right, because uh, V is equal to lambda times F. Now, I forgot to bring my Coke bottle, I'm sorry. You ever blown into a Coke bottle? Ooh, imagine that. That is that first frequency. You get a certain resonance frequency that sets up inside of the bottle. But something that you might not have done, I might try to go get it if we get into a clicker question of time, it's in my office. If you blow really fast across the top of a Coke bottle, you can get the higher frequencies. Because you don't just get that, you can also get, you can get higher frequencies when you blow air across a Coke bottle. It's in my office. I'll repeat it when we get a chance. Um, so I can get other frequencies. So taking the same tube, it's still length L. Uh, now I can get a wave that looks like this. There's one wave, and then the reflected wave looks like this. All right. How many wavelengths is this? It's not a half. What is it? is three quarters, right. This would be a half if I finished right here. So this is three quarter wavelengths. Or if you want to think of it in another way, you could think of it as three times one quarter wavelengths. Because you see, in the open closed tube, I can only cram an integer value, an integer number of quarter wavelengths, or a whole number of quarter wavelengths. So in my open closed tube, I got three one quarter wavelengths. 
Uh, and then I can do the same thing as I did over here, and I find that my frequency in this tube is going to be higher. It's 3V over 4L. Okay? And then I can do, finally I can go up, you can imagine, how many, wave, how many quarter wavelengths am I going to cram into this tube, you think? I got one in the first one. I got three in this one. How many am I going to get in this one? I'm going to get five. So the way, the nature that I have a node on one end and an antinode on the other, I get an odd number of quarter wavelengths. And let's see, this is going to look I think this is right. Yeah, and there I have five quarter wavelengths. I can also figure out my frequency. My frequency then, in this case, is going to be uh, 5V over 4L. All right. And then we can go on and on. We can do the next two, the next resonant frequency will have seven wavelengths, the next will have nine wavelengths, and on and on. So we can develop this expression for F. F of N is going to equal to um, N times the speed of the wave, that's V, it's the speed of sound and air, time, over 4L. And here, N is equal to 1, 3, 5, 7, on and on, odd numbers. You'll have this on your equation sheet. Okay. Now, unfortunately, I meant to put an extra page in here. I'm sorry, I just, I just don't have it. So, uh, if you want to go down, you could write it in the homework section, or there might be an extra page in the back. I'm sorry. But I do want to show you this for uh, tubes that are open on one end and closed on the other. Or, excuse me, that are open on both ends, or that they're closed on both ends. So they're going to be identical. So let's do, if I have a tube that's open on both ends, what do I get at this end? Do I get a node or an antinode at that end? I'm sorry, don't find a page. Sorry, very, very sorry. Do I get a node or an antinode at the end of my open open tube? I get an antinode, right, because it doesn't move there. Or it does move, it's, it is allowed to oscillate. And so my wave, the first resonance, the fundamental tone, will look like that. And then it'll reflect back on itself and it'll look like that. I get an antinode here. All right. If I have a closed, closed tube, but honestly, you can't really get a sound in a closed, closed tube. But I'm going to go ahead and present it here because in a closed, closed tube, I can't get a sound because I can't put any air into it, right? I can't get any movement of air into it. But it's the same as a string, like a guitar string. So this is identical to a guitar string. But since we're talking about tubes, like organ tubes and stuff like that, then we'll just consider it to be a closed closed tube. Does that understand? That doesn't actually exist, but it's the same as a guitar string, where it's fixed on both ends. On this case, what will I get on either end? Node or antinode? I get a node, right. So I get one wave that looks like that, and then the reflected wave looks like that. I get nodes on both, in, both ends. Notice that this is my length L, this is my length L, and in both of these cases, I get a half of a wavelength crammed into the tube. Right, I get a half of a wavelength that is this part of the wave extends across one half wavelength. And then, if I go up to my next frequency, keeping the same length tube, go up to my next frequency, it'll look like that. The reflected wave will look like that. How many wavelengths do I have there? I have one wavelength. So I have one wavelength here, 
and my next tube would have uh, three half wavelengths, the next tube would have four half wavelengths or two wavelengths, and on and on. So my next tube, I would get three halves wavelength. My next tube, I'd get uh, four halves or two wavelengths. And the same thing would happen with my closed, closed tube. That as I keep going down and down, I'll get more and more wavelengths crammed into those. Now, the frequency for these The frequency for these, well, L will equal to N lambda over 2. Um, so lambda will equal 2L over N. And since frequency is V over lambda, then my frequency is equal to NV over 2L. So that is the frequency for my different harmonics. For the first harmonic, it will be 1 times the wave speed over twice the length of the tube. For the second harmonic, it will be higher than that. The third harmonic, on and on. If you play the guitar, sometimes you'll hear people play harmonics. It's not that you're actually pushing the string all the way down to the fret, but you just hold your string lightly about halfway, halfway down the string. Y'all have done this? Like I think it's like Guns and Roses or somebody, they do. Or Pearl Jam, somebody, I don't matter, somebody from the 90s uh, would play harmonics a lot, and guitar players do this. But if you play guitar, if you hold your finger right to the string, you'll develop these harmonics, you'll hear these harmonics. It's a little bit different from an actual fretting of the string, but instead you just hold it lightly and it produces these harmonics. Okay? We'll do some quicker questions on this to give you some idea of sort of what to expect. Um, let's see, where are we here? Do y'all remember where we left off on these quicker questions? You might, you might print them out. Did nobody print them? Are you serious after all that back and forth? I did send y'all a message, right, that they were available? Did y'all read my message? <laughs> did I say that they were available on the concept? Y'all didn't print them? I'm pretty sure we did all these. Did this one? These are all pretty easy. Uh, we, I don't think we did this one, did we? Okay, let's look at this. Oh, yeah, this is a good question. All right, so we have a couple of things here. We have a two meter long piano string, mass of 10 grams. It's under a tension of 338 newtons. Find the velocity with which a wave travels on this string. Let me just remind you, for a string under tension, that the frequency is equal to 1 over 2L, square root of T over mu. And that mu is our linear mass density. The linear mass density. We saw that early on in this chapter. So if I want to know the, the velocity, if I can find the frequency, then I also need to know the wavelength on this string for the tone on this string, and I can calculate what is the velocity. Y'all work on that. I'm going to link it back to the right now.
I'm going to help you out a little bit with this. Listen, you'll need to find your mass density, that's mu. That's just going to be the mass divided by the length. It's a linear mass density. So it is the mass, which is 10 grams, that's 10 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, divided by the length, which is 2. So that's 5 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per meter. So that is, that should help you to find the frequency. But then the next step is finding the wavelength. What is the wavelength of this wave that travels along this string? And that's one of the tricky parts of this. What is the wavelength of this wave that travels along this piano string? All right, we'll go about 10 more seconds. If you're not sure, just guess. I'll stop at 335. While you're thinking about that, I'm going to show you this bottle. So my son collects bottles, and he found this bottle in the garbage or whatever. You know it's really old, but fine. Anyway, listen. All right, that's an open closed tube. That's the first frequency. All right, so I get a node on one end and an empty node on the other. Yeah, no ends in there because it's open on this end. Well, listen, if I, it's kind of hard to do. You have to blow it really fast across the top of something. That's the next higher frequency. Can you tell that that's a higher frequency than the one we had before? That's the second overtone, or the second fundamental frequency. And then the third, if you can blow it more, I can't go that fast. But uh, you can get higher tones, presumably. All right, so I'm going to stop this right now, 420. Uh, hey, he is right. That's awesome. Because you figured out the wavelength is what? What is the wavelength on this string? It's four meters, right? Because this is an open, our closed, closed string is fixed on this end and this end. So my wave, my, uh, my wave looks like this. That's a half a wavelength. Since it's two meters long, that means that the wavelength is equal to four meters of the sound wave on this string, or the, the wave traveling on this string. Now you can find the frequency. Uh, you have L, you have T, you have mu, and it works out that that frequency is 65 hertz. Uh, v is equal to lambda times F, so it's just four times 65, which is 260 hertz. All right. Some of these problems are more complicated than ones we've done in the past on concept tests, but again, the solution is on that website, that online quiz site. So feel free to go there. If you're not getting it here, uh, come see me on Monday or, or check it out on that website. So the answer is 260. Transverse, oh, uh, we're going to skip this one. This one turns out to be quite a bit more complicated than I thought. The tension in a gar guitar string is increased by a factor of two. Use those tuning keys and it increases the tension of your guitar string. <laughs> now, what factor does the wave velocity change? A couple things you're dealing with. Frequency. What factor does the wave velocity change?
All right, we'll stop at uh, 125, 125. Just guess if you're not sure. They're doing pretty well, most of you. Or, yeah, we're a little bit split, but 125. Okay, the right answer here is B, 1.4, because if I increase my tension by a factor of 2, the square root of 2 is 1.4. So I'll increase my frequency by a factor of root 2, which is 1.4. And then, if I increase this by 1.4, that's going to increase my velocity by 1.4 as well. But wait a minute, you say, because didn't you say that if I change my frequency, that that doesn't affect the wave speed? That the only way to change the wave speed is to do the what? Change the what? The medium, right. But in this case, we are changing the medium. By increasing the tension, you change the medium. And in fact, on a guitar string, our wavelength is fixed. Because the wavelength of your wave traveling on a guitar string, or any string, or in a pipe, is fixed because it's dependent upon the length of the string. Right? So that wavelength is going to remain the same, but the, the speed at which your wave travels back and forth will increase when you increase the frequency. And I'm going to skip these, okay, uh, just for the sake of time, because they're all just sort of exploring different things. But again, you can go online, or we can talk about them on Monday. But these are just exploring uh, different when you change different things. How does it? How do those equations change? We've already done decibels, right? Sound intensity level. All right, so let's look at that. Uh, here I have the sound intensity. 5 meters from a point source is 0.5 watts per square meter. The power output of the source then is what? Let's go to 135, and I'll stop. Okay, B is right. Here, we're just looking at the intensity, is power over area, uh, and my intensity is 0.5. My power is what I want to know, and my area is 4 pi times 5 squared. If I solve that for power, I get 160 watts. Okay? Remember, these are sort of indicative of what you'll see on the test coming up, so make sure that you focus on these questions, as well as the ones we did in the notes and read through the notes, as well as the homework. So focus. I'll go through the homework, and I'll pull questions from that for the test. Uh, the intensity of sound wave A is 100 times that of sound wave B. Relative to wave B, the sound level of A is what? So here we're looking at intensity level, not intensity. But A has 100 times the intensity of B. What is their difference in level, intensity level? Remember we had those sort of key things you need to remember, that if I have a difference 
of so and so many decibels, that's an intensity difference of what, and on and on. All right, I'll stop at 105, 105. D is right. Remember, a difference in 20 decibels is a factor of 100 in intensity. A difference of 10 decibels is a factor of 10 in intensity. A factor of 30 decibels is a factor of what? 1,000. 10 is 100, or 10 is 10, 20 is 100, 30 is 1,000, 40 is 10,000, and on and on. So make sure that you're aware of those sort of quick measurements. We'll do one that's actually where you have to calculate it. But here we have the intensity is 6 microwatts per square centimeter. If you raise the level by 10 decibels, what's the new intensity going to be? You raise the level by an amount of 10 decibels, it goes from 6 microwatts per square centimeter to what? 55. Okay, good. A is right. If I increase my intensity level by 10 decibels, say I go from 10 to 20 decibels, that increases the intensity 6 microwatts by a factor of 10. So it goes from 6 to 60. Okay, this one's a little trickier. Um, I'm going to help you with this one. I'm just going to show you this one, okay? But it's a good test question. So make sure that you're able to manipulate the intensity level equation and work it in an appropriate way. So here, the sound level at point B is 14 decibels below the sound level at a point one meter from a point source. The distance from the source to point P then is what? Uh, well, first of all, at point P, is the sound quieter or louder than it is at one meter from the source? It's quieter. So P is farther away, right? We know that. In fact, none of these answers, except for A, is going to be closer. So I can just go ahead and get rid of A. So I know that I have to be farther away because the sound is quieter. It's 14 dB below the sound level. I can go back to my uh, equation for intensity level. 10 log of I1 over I2. And this will be on your equation sheet. 14 then is equal to 10 log of I1 over I2. So I get 1.4. How do I get rid of a logarithm? I raise it to the tenth, like to a tenth power like that. This cancels out that logarithm. 10 to the 1.4 is 25. So 25 is equal to I1 over I2. So I am decreasing my intensity by a factor of 25. How much am I increasing my distance then to decrease my intensity by a factor of 25? Well, I is equal to power over 4 pi r squared. I'm decreasing my intensity by, a 20, by 25. What do I have to do to r to get this over here? I have to multiply it by what? by 5, because 5 squared is 25. And so I'm going from 1 meter to what? To 5 meters. All right? The solutions of these are online, so if you're not catching these, I know this is kind of fast, but is this okay? 
Y'all okay with me? Yes? Okay. Answer's five. Uh, we'll come back to these later. All right, let's look at the human production and detection of sound. Uh, Y'all had anatomy yet? Some of you, some of you not. Okay, just sort of some basic stuff about how humans produce and perceive sound. Uh, humans can only detect in the audible region. I think it's audible. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I used the word sonic. In the sonic region of the spectrum, audible is also correct. But this is from about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. We've already done that with the, did y'all do that with your friends? Can you hear this tone? Didn't we do that? Yeah. So try that out. Uh, we can, your infrasonic is below 20 hertz. Your ultrasonic is above 20,000 hertz. Ultrasound equipment uses about 20,000, you think, hertz? No, 20 million hertz. Ultrasound equipment, so there's no possibility to ever hear an ultrasound. It uses about 20 million hertz for when you use ultrasound, like for seeing babies or measuring the speed of blood and what have you. And you have some homework, actually, that has to do with ultrasound equipment. Also, animals are known to communicate by infrasonic waves. which can travel large distances. Do y'all know any animals that communicate by infrasonic waves? The whales, right. Did I tell y'all about that record that I got when I was a kid? When I was a kid in National Geographic, sometimes they had put in records, and they were like the floppy records that you could put on your record player, and it was the whales, the call of the whales. And I remember as a kid, it was being very fascinating. You know the whale call? I mean, you can hear part of it, but a lot of the signal is infrasonic. It's very low frequency, so it travels through the oceans for many, 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 many miles. All right, well, let's look at the anatomy and physiology of speech production. Speech is caused by the movement of air past the vocal cords. These are also called the vocal folds. Uh, the air is forced past the vocal cords because of the diaphragm, which can change the volume of the chest cavity. Don't know that, that your lungs aren't actually muscles. Your lungs can't move themselves. So your diaphragm can push up and or can expand or decrease the size of your chest cavity. That your lungs don't do that. That's your diaphragm. It's a big sheet-like muscle. Uh, air moves from the lungs through the through the trachea or the windpipe. Uh, and then to the larynx, which has the, uh, the vocal cords. What is the larynx? What do we sometimes call it? It's sort of right here in your throat. The larynx is this thing. You can feel it. What is this? The Adam's apple, right? So this is sometimes called the Adam's apple. The larynx is sort of just cartilage that protects the vocal cords, the Adam's apple. Um, vocal cords are inside the larynx. Which protects and moves them with cartilage muscles. <coughs> All right, the cords are actually muscles that can open or close and the space between the cords is called the glottis. And I'm, so if I look, if I were to look at a cross section, these would be my two cords. Uh, this is called the glottis. And when you close the glottis, that's called a glottal stop. That's when you close the glottis. 
it causes a particular sound. Are any singers in the class? Y'all know what you ever heard of what a glottal stop is? No. Like uh it occurs when you say some word you that's a glottal stop, because you're you're stopping the air in your throat, uh, closing up the glottis. It's called a glottal stop. Pop security is a glottal stop. Uh, the frequency of the sound is given by this equation, which we've seen already, 1 over 2L, square root of T over mu. And so a greater tension in the vocal cords will give a higher frequency. And then also, the length of the vocal cords affects the frequency. So in our vocal cords, we can't really affect our mass density or the length of our vocal cords. We're just born with that. But when we give a higher pitch or a lower pitch sound, high, low, high, low, that's because we're changing the tension in the vocal cords. Okay, so uh, men tend to have a larger larynx and longer vocal cords. So they have lower uh, pitch voices, typically. It's dependent on a lot of things, but at its very base value, it's the length of your vocal cord. Vocal cords, if they're long, you're going to get a lower pitch sound, just like in a bass or in other string instruments. And then the amplitude is just governed by the amount of air that flows past the cords. Okay, folks, listen, just sort of basic information on this. Know what the pieces are called. Uh, I might even give you a picture of the various parts. So, you know, like if these are the lungs, this is the diaphragm down here. The larynx comes up from the lungs, or excuse me, the trachea is right there. The larynx, And inside the larynx, you have the vocal cords. So just knowing those basic things about this. If you've had anatomy, you should have gone over this. Am I right? You do this in anatomy? A few of you that have had it. Anatomy, you'll cover this? Yes. In greater detail, I presume? Yes. OK. In a lot by greater detail. I'm taking anatomy. Did I tell you all this? I'm trying to. Like, I'm just reading the textbook on my own. And it's not going very well. Like I'm not, I'm not doing very well in the course because I'm the teacher and I'm not a very good teacher. But I'm just trying to read the book, and that gets kind of dry. Maybe you have to come to your anatomy class. Is it fun? No. Yeah, see, that's what I think. All right. So uh, anyway, let's look at the anatomy and physiology of hearing. Again, just sort of basic stuff, and that'll wrap us up. Here are three parts: external, middle, and internal. This is also called the outer ear, the middle ear, and then the inner ear. Just need to know the basic parts of these. In the outer ear, you have the auricle. That's this funky thing that you have on the side of your head. The auricle is the visible part of the ear. Uh, it directs sound waves to the ear. In fact, it looks really funky because the shape of it helps to direct sound waves that you can actually hear. So it directs sound waves in our audible spectrum, that 20 to 20,000 hertz, helps to funnel them down into our ear canal. The ear canal is the next part. It's about an inch long. It's about that long. Um, open on one end, closed at the other. So it's like our open closed tubes that we have, where we have an antinode at one end and a node at the other. The end that it's closed at uh, has the eardrum, and it helps to amplify the sound. And then finally, the or not finally, the middle ear has the eardrum. The eardrum is sometimes called the tympanic membrane. You know what a tympani is? The drums that they have in orchestras, tympani looks like this. You have a guy 
with the big things. And he goes, you know the guy I'm talking about? The tympany. So it's like that. It's a big membrane stretched across the ear canal that when, um, when sound waves, pressure waves impinge upon it, they'll cause it to move back and forth, back and forth, depending upon the frequency of the sound waves. They're also called th three bones. These are called the auditory, what are they called? Ossicles. So these are the auditory ossicles, the smallest bones in the body, I understand. They're also a lever. They take the, the, the pressure on the eardrum and they amplify it by like a factor of 20. Uh, the middle ear also has an opening to the pharynx called the eustachian tube. Uh, this connects inside your eardrum down to about here into your larynx so that your larynx is connected up to your eardrum. You ever wonder why when you get congested you can't hear? Yes, that's why because when you get congested all the stuff sort of gets clogged up and you just can't hear as well because you start getting fluid behind your ears. That's also why kids often get uh, ear infections and they get tubes put in their ears because their eustachian tube doesn't drain properly. So they'll have tubes put in their ears to help drain that fluid out. Some of you might have had tubes in your ears when you were like this tall. Let's see, eardrum is also called the tympanate membrane. I've already said that. It vibrates when sound impinges upon it. The ossicles, these are three small bones. Uh, you don't need to know the names, but I'll go ahead and give them to you here. But I'm not going to ask you to tell me the names. It's the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And these transfer vibrations from the eardrum to the inner ear. And the force of these vibrations is multiplied by about a factor of 20. All right. Uh, listen, we're about out of time. I'm going to send, we have a screencast for this section. I think it'll be okay, but I will be here on Monday. So I know today was kind of fast. If you want to come on Monday, we'll spend more time on this. I think that'll be a good time for a lot of you. Sort of a smaller class. You can do it for me. Okay? But otherwise, I'm not going to see you until Friday. All right? I will be around on Wednesday. So if you need help, please come see me. What? No, no clicker questions on Monday. But we can go over the questions from the, the clicker questions.